be talking to two mixologists, you guys, who are doing awesome things. They are um, raising money for breast cancer, but um, I'm excited to talk with them because they have really interesting backgrounds and how they got into mixology is super cool as well. So they'll be joining us momentarily from a different handle. Adriana, my handy AV person is here. Um, and let's see, are they there yet? We're Not here. Yeah, oh, there they are. Hi, ladies. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you both? Uh, well, it's a little rainy and cold in New York today, but other than that, we're doing all right. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, um, but spring is on its way. It so is. It's please. knocking on our door, and we are so excited to greet it. We're like, come on, the roaring 20s are coming, and we're like, let's get after it. <laughs> I know. It's been a rough winter in so many ways, so um, I hope spring is just around the corner, and I'm so happy to meet you both. So I've got to introduce you to everybody. This is Ivy and Lynette. They are co-founders of an organization called Speed Rack, which is the first all-female high-speed bartending competition designed to highlight up-and-coming women in the cocktail industry and give back to those impacted by breast cancer. So ladies, I am so happy to meet you, and it's so great to see what you've been doing, both combining mixology with philanthropy, which is the perfect cocktail, in my opinion. So first, let me just ask you quickly, how did you guys get into mixology? Ivy, let me start with you. Yeah, um, I actually got into it because I was teaching photography in an orphanage in Guatemala and walked into a bar one day and was like, I love it here. I never really experienced bar culture. And I kind of like had my own version of cheers down there. This is like pre Facebook, pre, you know, people even traveling with cell phones. So if you want to meet someone, you'd be like, Hey, meet me at the bar. And I fell in love with it and then moved to New York. Um, after living in Guatemala for about four years and got into the bartending scene here, fell in love with it, met Lynette, a fellow woman of which there weren't many. Um, and was like, I kind of want to pioneer this industry with with my pioneer lady friend. <laughs> Which is so great. And and I should just mention, Ivy, your last name is Miss. What it the is. hell is going on with you people in this industry? I've, met, I've heard of like uh, 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 Jim Beveridge, who works for Johnny Walker. We yep. had Emma Walker, uh, who's a mixologist I talked to last week. I'm like, what in the hell? Is that your real name? It's my real name. My father's last name is Mix. My twin sister's <laughs> last name is Mix. It was... I was either going to be a DJ or a bartender, and I'm happy I picked bartender. <laughs> That's so funny. Now, and, and by the way, I should mention, Ivy, you also worked with horses all over South America. You wrote a book about horses. I wrote a book about cocktails. It's called Spirits of Latin America. It's oh, Spirits somewhere. of Latin. But what was your horse connection? I used to train horses. That was the other life I had. So when I was, li I was born and raised in Vermont, so I used to train horses, and I always thought that was the life I was going to go into until I discovered bartending. And I was like, working till 4 a.m. is kind of counter to waking up at 4 a.m. and going to the barn. And yeah. I was like, bar, barn, bar, barn, bar one. But I still ride horses when I, when I can. Oh, that's great. And Lynette, tell me your backstory real quickly, how you got into bartending, because I know you guys are working hard to make sure that women have a seat at the bar or the counter. Someone mentioned this counter is really high. I'm actually sitting. I'm actually sitting on a stool. Everybody, I'm five foot three. I'm short, but but not that short. But Lynette, how did you get into the business? I mean, I kind of got into it like a lot of people did. Uh, after 9/11, I uh, chose I was never going to work in an office again. And previously, I refused to be the cliche waiter, actor, and bartend because everyone I knew was like. It was always, what do you really do if you worked in a restaurant or bar? And I just jumped into it and I found, you know, Broadway went through a lot of like bad economic times and I found the bar life and I found, you know, this great place where you could have theater, but with people and give them your liquid art. And there was, you know, rounds of applause where people were learning new things about your drinks. And, and we kind of tapped into that theatricality when we decided to yeah. start Speed Rack because People want to be entertained. That's the, you know, part of what we've all missed during this time is going to our favorite bars and restaurants and seeing that interaction with the bartenders and the teams that are there who are just really excited to share what they have with you. And so Speed Rec was about putting these women on a pedestal and showing you how incredibly entertaining and exciting it is to watch bartenders work and build rounds of cocktails and 
the artistry and the athleticism of it is pretty incredible. And, and we built a whole competition around it <laughs> and got people to donate a lot of money to uh, breast cancer research and education. So I mean, you, <laughs> you have raised a lot of money. Tell us how much money you've raised and where the money goes to and how people can contribute who may be watching this and want to help your cause. Absolutely. So you can always find our website, uh, speed-rack.com. It's a link in our bio. Um, but we've raised clear almost one and a half million dollars now. Uh, we were cut short by obviously the pandemic and our season. Um, but we've done the competition in seven countries. Uh, so we have actually expanded globally. We uh, really look for charities that are looking at different perspectives on breast cancer. So a lot goes into research. We actually follow one of our favorite researchers to, uh, he went from Avon to Pink Agenda, so we go and followed him there. But then we also look at organizations that are trying to, uh, one, look at the disparities in breast cancer between BIPOC women and, you know, uh, it's just, there's just a lot of different things we're trying to tackle. And then a, a few other things that are very, you know, specific, like actually access to um, breast treatment, access to healthcare, access to things that a lot of women, when they go through this, you know, don't even know where to get a mammogram. So really trying to get some of those pieces uh, and making sure that we're looking at the whole um, the whole disease yes. and, and really tackle that. And women helping women and all those kind of things. But even looking at some of the organizations tackle the, the mental health uh, side of going through it and being alone and having, you know, other women who have been through it there to support and help you. Exactly. Well, my friend Sarah Sanders is battling breast cancer right now and she's watching and she said thank you so much that uh, she has tears just hearing how much you all are doing for breast cancer research. And Sarah's a, an incredible person and a real trooper. So Sarah, You're keep, on, it, Sarah. keep on keeping on. Do, are either of you all breast cancer survivors? Is there a reason why you just my, chose breast cancer? My mother-in-law is. Um, she's actually been 20 years a uh, survivor. So that's, uh, it. We, we just saw it as something that people really connect with, you know, it's really rare that you're someone who hasn't yeah. had, whether it's their best friend's mom or somebody who went through it. And it was a natural like time for bartenders to kind of get behind a cause. You know, one of the charities we work with really works with um, people who are underinsured and hospitality workers fall completely in that realm. Yeah. So if you get an exam through their, uh, their breast treatment task force, they actually then help you pay for your bills, which is really important when you're trying to work with as a gig economy person. And so yeah. we just thought that that was something, you know, this cause was really important. And, you know, as women coming together globally, we actually really realized how much, um, you know, we can make an impact. And bartenders, when you give us a shaker, we will, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we will do a lot. And this skill really helps raise money. So <laughs> yeah. people love to, you know, every charity event you go to, if there's a yeah, great, I want uh, to come to bar and you're going to get more donations. <laughs> I want to come to your next competition. In the meantime, I want to try to make, so you guys have to let us know. And if people want to contribute, uh, where do they, um, where would they go to contribute? You can go to our website, speed-rack.com, or just click on our profile here on Instagram, and we'll take you there to some of the charities that we really are aligned with. Uh -huh. Because fighting breast cancer is really important, but not all breast cancer charities are created equal, and we've done a really, um, a lot of hard work kind of curating a group that we think are doing the best work. That's awesome. Okay, ladies, what are we going to make today? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, we're going to be making my drink, which I'm uh, very excited to be working with Jane Walker and just everything that Jane Walker, you know, exemplifies is very uh, obviously near and dear to our heart. Um, so this is a drink uh, that is kind of a riff on a smash. So there's a classic drink called a bourbon smash or a whiskey smash, and it's called a smash because you're muddling up things, right? Um, this here is a muddler. Um, I like muddled drinks because they tend to, um, they demand that you, that you use fresh juice, right? Because okay. you have lemon and you have to muddle it and it's fresh. Because if you use like that type of juice, if you like go to a store and it's um, like the type of juice you get in like the fake lemon, it's not very tasty. <laughs> it's oxidized, yeah. it's gross. So if you, if you tell someone you must muddle this lemon, um, it works out a lot better. Um, okay. so, so my drink is actually, it, we've got obviously the star of the show, Jane Walker, but we also have um, a bit of Pim's, 
This okay. drink is inspired by a certain fantastic, I'm not actually sure if I'm allowed to say her name, but she's won quite a few tennis matches. Uh, that's a hint. Um, she's a complete icon. And when I think of like keep walking and like keep fighting against the system, this woman, initials are SW. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure if I can say her name. She's amazing. And Wimbledon um, is a, oh. I was actually supposed to go, go to Wimbledon. <laughs> oh, we can, we can, oh, I thought you were talking about somebody from the past. No, this current. Isn't. Okay. Current. I think you're talking about Serena. So that's let's right, that's right. You can say it. Serena, <laughs> Serena to me is like, she's one of my biggest icons, someone who just like keeps on going and, and like rolls with the punches and then goes beyond the punches. Um, and then this past year, when COVID, when the pandemic was going on, I was actually supposed to go to Wimbledon. So this drink is inspired by that place and that woman. So okay. being that it's a smash, what you're going to do is you're going to take a lemon and you're yeah. going to quarter it into four pieces. So you're going to take a lemon, cut it in half, kind of like you have the two poles, North Pole and South Pole, cut it down the middle and cut that half into uh, four sections. I kind of did it heavy. wrong, but that's okay. I did that's I did it like that. Oh, third, that's perfect too. Just squeeze it before you put it in. Yeah, just <laughs> squeeze it and put it in. If you don't have a muddler, don't worry. Um, I'm gonna get a, it. I'm gonna get a spoon. I'm gonna get a, a see if I have a wooden spoon yeah, or something that I can perfectly. use. That's perfect. <laughs> and honestly, if you don't have it, that's also totally fine. If you squeeze the lemon in, that's gonna release the oils, which is kind of the point of it, and that's totally fine also. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, so then you're going to take some mint and you're going to take your nice fresh mint and you're going to take, you want to take off the stem and you're going to put about six, four to six mint leaves in there. Okay. Give or take off the stem. So I did, I did four lemons. Is that, that okay? That's great. That's perfect. Yep. And now you want to get your mint. You just drop that in there. It's going to, we're going to be like, take care of it. Um, and then if you have a muddler or a wooden spoon, fantastic. If not, that's also okay. A shaking will do basically the same thing. Okay. I think muddlers are cool. I found an ice cream scoop. Would that do oh, it? Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> this is the best for pandemic uh, cocktail making. You have to do what you have around, which is- So great. muddling, I'm just kind of mushing the mint. You're and mushing. Lemon around. You're smushing. So this is a, this is a smash, right? Um, so it's smashing because we're smashing it. We're smashing all the ingredients together. Okay. Um, so then what we're going to do is you're going to take some honey. Okay. Ideally, you have some loose honey. Um, if you don't have loose honey, that's okay. Sometimes honey's in the raw. It's hard to measure. We're going to do two teaspoons of honey. Okay. So I see you have a jigger there, too. That would also work. A jigger is totally fine. It's a bit yep. Use like a quarter ounce, so yeah. that big side, you know, you just quarter the way up and that, that yeah. side there, yep. Give like, or take, kind of like in between a half and a quarter. Yeah, a that little one looks great, so just kind of, yeah. And honey is sticky, obviously, so, so I really like to make sure I get all the sweetness out so it's not um, too dry. Yeah, so pour that in. Pour that in, mm -hmm. yep. By the way, could I use maple syrup? You know, I don't really love honey. Yeah. I mean, anything sweet works. And also, I'm born raised in Vermont, so I am a massive maple syrup fan. So as far as I'm concerned, put maple syrup in anything, move over honey. You don't need to yeah, be here Yeah, I don't anymore. know why. I've never really caught into the taste of honey. Yeah, it's, it can be polarizing, you know? Um, but Okay, now anyway. what do I do? So now you're going to take your the small side, your, oh, one pinch of salt. So if you have any salt there. I do. You're going to take a pinch of salt. I was very organized. <laughs> You're so organized. So okay. one little pinch of salt, throw that in there. What? Why salt? Salt is a, so sugar and salt are flavor heighteners, right? So whenever you have something sweet or something salty, it's going to take the flavors that are already there and heighten them. In this particular sense, scotch, and I, I love Jane Walker for this reason, is that it has a sweetness, hence the honey, and also a little bit of salinity from the peat. Okay. So the salt just kind of makes this, it really makes the Jane Walker sing, okay. which, is the, which is the point. <laughs> okay, um, now what do I do? So now you're going to take your jigger, and you're going to take the small side, and we're going to do a, a quarter, yep, perfect. We're going to do about half that of sherry. 
half of it. Oloroso sherry. I'm a big sherry fan. <laughs> um, frequently, scotch can be That's aged in, sh in, sh in sherry casks. Um, it's very beautiful. It's a little bit oaky, a little bit rich, and it's beautiful. Then we're going to take Pims. Pims, the, your classic Pims and lemonade is what this you is drink. like. This is like the girl animals version of making <laughs> cocktails. <laughs> You got all the mini bottles. This is like perfect, like cocktail box at home. <laughs> okay, how much Pims? Pims is delicious. How much? Four rounds again, same amount as the sherry, equal parts. <laughs> yeah. And then we're gonna do one ounce of the star of the show, the Jane Walker. Okay. Um, this and is this an ounce? Yep, yep all the way up yep, to the top. All the way up to the top. <laughs> And I particularly like this drink because you can make it in a few different ways. Um, you can, <laughs> my bar back here is gonna grab my ice, which I forgot okay. in my kitchen. Please hold it. Do I put, <laughs> now do I put ice in it, Ivy? You're gonna put ice in it, yeah. So traditionally smashes, yes. if you want to, you can just shake up your drink as hard as you can. And we call it rolling. You just take off the, the cap and you roll it into your, into your, um, thank you. You roll it into your drink. You can do that, or you can strain over fresh ice, which I honestly like doing, especially when I've muddled mint into my cocktail, because it can get, no one wants mint in their teeth. It's not sexy. It's not okay. fun. Do I get yes. it? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Shake. That is so good. And remember, when you're shaking, you want to make sure that you're shaking the same thing we always say in Speed Rack, which, you know, Speed Rack's a breast cancer charity. It's also uh, a female bartending competition. It's about Speed Rack. It's about working. Exactly. Aggressive. You want lots of movement. <laughs> yes. Okay. What we always say is it's about shaking it awake, not rocking it to sleep. Right? Okay. I, I can't ever do so this. Can you just you flip guys? it over so the smaller sides on the other, on the top? So flipped or shaker. Yeah, perfect. And then see where there's a little bit of air on the side? Just yeah. give it a, a little whack on the side there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I learned something I today, like ladies. I like cocktail doctor. I can see what's happening. <laughs> okay. And now do I put it over ice? Yes, over ice. I like straining my cocktails over ice because when, when I have muddled mint, because I don't really want all that mint in my teeth. My real I always do this wrong. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so so that strainer wrong. right there, Katie, I'm going to show you how to do that. So you want to, when you hold that strainer, you kind of hold from here, and then there's like a little piece where you kind of push forward. Yeah, so it, what it does is that we call it closing the gate, and that keeps all the minted things. So it sits kind of right in the top of the. Oh. Yeah. Do you yeah, have so a little you push it forward, here? it kind of, it, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I realize I haven't made Lynette one, so I'm going to have to make her one after after we do this. I'm a bad host. <laughs> I'm just going to have my Jane. <laughs> yeah, right now. Yeah, right that didn't make very, a very big drink, ladies. It's be I know. It's because um, you, can, you can make this larger if you want to, but because we're all about consuming responsibly, it's about not necessarily having that much alcohol per drink. So you're welcome to have more. But no, but I think you're right. With ice, that's a beautiful yeah. portion. And then to garnish, Katie, if you have if you have some more mint, we're gonna give it a nice little mint bouquet, right? I did it. Look, that? you did. Oh, okay, okay. So anyone who's watching at home, I'm ahead of you. You're ahead of me. You can win speed rack. <laughs> you're a natural, clearly. Um, so I'm gonna put my mint in, but instead of just putting it in, I like to hit it a few times. So what that does is it releases the oils of the mint leaves. Oh, Sounds that's great. a good idea. That's like how I slap basil in my exactly, precisely. exactly the same principle. And it, and it, you you could smell it, right? So that's yeah. the first thing is smelling that drink before. It's you good can see to it. get out your aggressions too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like you've had a long day. You're a little bit pent up. You need a drink, and you can beat up your mint and then have your drink. <laughs> well, I just want to say cheers, lady. It was lady. Cheers, ladies. It was so great meeting you. Thank you, you for well. everything you're doing for breast cancer research. Thank you for making uh, mixology a more equitable profession and uh, highlighting, highlighting everybody who is in the business. And I'm excited. 
Cheers to you. And cheers before to you. we say goodbye, let me tell you what I think of your drink. Uh-oh. Oh, and spouse. also, cheers to Sarah. We are yeah. all with you in solidarity, Sarah. Yeah. So. That's so nice. Sarah, I hope you're still watching. That's yummy. That's quite <laughs> tasty. I like it. Thank you. So do I. I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Got it. thank you. Thank you so thank much. You so thank, thank you, you Ivy and Lynette. Okay. Be well. Bye. Thank you so much. Happy Bye. Women's History Month. Happy Women's History Month. Thanks to Jane Walker. And now we are, yeah, thanks to Jane Walker. And now we're uh, going to talk to my friend Reshma, who is awesome. Reshma uh, started Girls Who Code, and she's uh, been doing incredible things, getting more girls uh, into coding. And so Reshma is somebody we thought is worthy of honoring. Yes, we'll put uh, the recipe for this drink and wake up call tomorrow, everybody. So Sign up for Wake Up Call. Go to katiecurric.com if you don't already. And thank you. I like my cardigan, too. Anyway, Reshma Sajani is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code, and she's done incredible work. It's an international nonprofit organization that is working to close the gender gap in technology. And Reshma is going to give us some advice for how to raise strong daughters who are brave and, uh, you know, and, and, and not risk averse and who are willing to take chances because... You can't really succeed if you don't put your hat in the ring, right? Um, by the way, yes, my, my sweater's from Talbot's. My friend Meredith sent it to me, and it's from Talbot's. And it also comes in pink, if anybody's interested. Anyway, um, Reshma is joining us momentarily. It says she's unable to join. Let's see if we can get her in here. We sent a request. Anyway, I hope you guys are enjoying these little cocktail tuto tutorials. I'm learning a lot, and I actually... Reshma. Hi, how, how are, are you? you? Good. How's it going? Everything's good. I'm so happy that here, but put your camera down a little. There you go. There we Perfect. go. By the way, your hair looks fabulous. Reshma. <laughs> I'm, that's what I've learned in COVID, how to do my hair and how to do my makeup. So well, uh, it's working for you, girl. <laughs> I love it. So Reshma, I just want to share your story with everybody who's watching mm. because you've done incredible things for girls and technology. You started Girls uh, Who Code in what, 2012, right, Rashma? Yep, and that's right. And you've also given a TED Talk that's been written, read, written, that's been watched by more than 5 million people, I believe. You also wrote a book about being brave, actually brave, not perfect, fear less, fail more, and live bolder, which I was happy to help promote and get the word out uh, for your incredible work. So, um, you know, before we talk about the pandemic, because you've, you've done another initiative that is so important uh, mm -hmm. about working moms and how they've suffered during the pandemic. But give us a quick elevator pitch on what Girls Who Code has done and what your goal was and how much you've achieved. Yeah, so when I started Girls Who Code, so Girls Who Code is a movement um, to close the gender gap in computer science and technology. Uh, less than 20% of the technology workforce is female, and we want to get to 50% by 2030. And so we offer free programs, uh, summer camps, after-school clubs, uh, college loops, to get girls to learn how to code with the hopes of getting them to want a major or minor in computer science and then go into the workforce. So when we started, every engineer would say, I want to hire women. I want to hire people of color. I just can't find them. So over the past 10 years, we built the pipeline. You know, we taught 300,000 girls to code. We've reached over half a billion. And so now the opportunity or the challenge is to get these companies to actually hire them. And so people always have to ask me, like, you know, what happens when girls learn how to code? And when girls learn how to code, we solve climate, COVID, and cancer, you know, because girls are change makers. Like, they're going to heal us. They're going to save us. And, like, you know this. You have daughters, right? Yes, There's too two of them. And there's something about girls who see a problem. Maybe their mom's uh, obese. Maybe their brother's dyslexic. Maybe their best friend is getting bullied at school. And they say to themselves, you know, I want to solve that problem. And so if we can create and inspire more creators, if we can have more innovators who are girls, who are young women, I think we can change the world. I think, and I think you have, and you're in the process of doing it. And you say the big challenge now is to get companies to hire them. Are you finding yeah. that now, especially after Me Too and Time's Up and even Black Lives Matter, these movements that have said, 
you know, the status quo needs to change. Are you finding that companies are willing to, um, you know, to, to hire some of these young women that you've trained and who are so talented in coding? I mean, not as fast as I would like. I think that many companies still believe it's a meritocracy and that they don't have a problem. And so you really have to work to root out the sexism and the discrimination. You know, you have to really tackle privilege and tackle bias head on. And so you have to do that kind of deep dissection of your culture and admit that you have a problem. And I think a lot of these companies have a hard time. And then listen, COVID happened. And what we found is almost 40% of our students that got their internships reneged or their full-time offers reneged. So here we were about to put into the pipeline talented young women, Black and Latina women, women of color, you know, diverse women. And then all of a sudden, companies weren't hiring at the same rate or they were making different types of decisions. And so we're back. And I think we, again, have to continue to exert that pressure. I mean, to me, it is a, it is a crime that many of these Fortune top companies, you know which ones I'm talking about, you know, they know what I've had for breakfast this morning. They know what I'm doing this weekend, but yet they can't move the needle more than just a percentage or two. You know, if they treated diversity like we treat finding talented football players, we would have solved this problem a long time ago. And so I think in this moment, we have to put on that pressure. Well, I think the pressure is on, and I think they get almost embarrassed if, uh, if they're not making changes internally and hope, hopefully will keep, keep their feet to the fire. You know, I did that, that hour on, on women mm -hmm. in technology and for National Geographic as part of my series, and it was, it was frustrating. It's sort of like death by a thousand cuts and those <laughs> attitudes that have to change inside these companies, not only in terms of hiring, but in terms of retention and changing the culture. So it's a place where women really truly feel they can thrive, strive yeah. and thrive. But um, yeah. you're doing this other awesome thing now. You have this Marshall Plan for Moms, Reshma, that you started during the pandemic. 2.3 million women, I think, lost their jobs or left the workforce during the last year because of the, the pandemic, because of unequal responsibility in the home. And we have set ourselves back decades in terms of the progress we've made with women in the workforce. So you, once again, are, are uh, you know, uh, attacking this issue head on with the Marshall Plan for Moms. Explain to everybody who's watching what that is. Yeah, so as you said, women are getting crushed in the pandemic. Mothers are getting crushed in the pandemic. You know, our labor market participation is where it was in 1989. So 30 years of progress gone so in shocking. nine months. And that happened for two reasons, right? The first thing is um, the schools closed and our childcare was unstable because we are one of the nations that doesn't offer universal childcare. And so because we had to log on our kids at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, you know, so many moms had to go on food stamps, move in with their parents, take the third shift, say no to that promotion. And, um, and it, they left the workforce. And the second reason is that many women found themselves in jobs that weren't pandemic proof. Retail, education, healthcare, these jobs aren't coming back. And so these two forces pushed women out of the workforce. I saw this happening kind of real time because, you know, so many of my students are under the poverty line are black and Latina. Black and Latina women lost jobs at four times the rate of white women. And it felt like nobody was saying anything. You know, my son is in public school in New York City and, you know, the mayor figured out the cost of the HVAC equipment and the cost of keeping teachers safe but he didn't figure out the cost of me and the consequence of me and women like me having to lose our jobs, you know, to homeschool. And that thought that you didn't even think about me, you didn't even ask, scared the hell out of me. And I saw so too many women, you know, lose their dreams, lose their mental health, lose everything. There's dignity, you know, in this year and for it to happen so fast. So I was like, where's the plan? <laughs> Where's the plan? And there was no plan. And so I wrote an article and then launched a campaign saying that we need a Marshall Plan for Moms. We need a 360 plan. We need cash payments to mothers. We need to finally pass paid leave and affordable childcare, two things that you know you've been, we've been fighting for forever. And we need to retrain this workforce. And as mothers re-enter, we need, need to make it possible for them to you know, survive and thrive. Flexibility, remote working, on-ramps, et cetera. I mean, I could go on. 
But the point is, we need a bold plan. How optimistic are you with the first woman vice president, uh, which is so shocking that that is even a first at this point in time, but are, are you optimistic that these issues, these really important issues are going to get attention and there might be some kind of action, not only on the part of, of uh, you know, corporations, but also with some kind of government support? Listen, I think that the, the administration has done an incredible job tackling poverty and child poverty, but I don't think that these solutions are tackling women's labor market participation. And so I want to see a specific task force that is ha that like literally is tackling this with like KPIs of like how quickly we, I mean, you remember under Obama, it took us eight years you know, after the recession to get back to where we were eight years. And this one's even worse. And so look, the child care tax credit, it's a down payment on the Marshall Plan. It's revolutionary. But in and of itself, it's not enough. We didn't get paid leave in this bill. You know, we got some progress on affordable child care, but the federal government also has to push the states and push the private sector uh, to do the right thing. We know that mothers were suffering a, a penalty before the pandemic. And we know that schools are simply not going to just open and everything's going to be okay. You know, our children are fundamentally broken. And I just, I just think that like, we're not doing enough. Well, hopefully, you know, by talking about this, by keeping the conversation going, by keeping the, putting the pressure on, there will be some change uh, around the corner. And, you know, I wanted to ask you about the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, something that's it's kind of complicated, something that I have long supported and there was some action in the House yesterday. You wrote a piece about the ERA, an op-ed for Ms. Magazine. Can you just in, very simply help people understand what is going on with the Equal Rights Amendment, why it's needed, and the strange thing that happened that kept it from getting ratified? Well, I mean, I think from what I understand, I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment is at its core equal rights, equal rights in every aspect of the law, right? So many things, even the way Social Security is administered, it's not equal. And, and so we, we didn't pass that amendment, um, but we have an opportunity to do it now. And I think we have momentum around it. I can't believe we're still fighting for it. But I wonder, like, if we had the ERA, you know, would mothers have gotten crushed in this way? I don't know. Yeah, but it's definitely a step in the right direction because it, there was a deadline for ratification. Yes. And I guess the House voted yesterday to extend, to basically extend the deadline, right? And and yeah. uh, to remove it actually. So it's a re it's a joint resolution. Um, and so I know Jane Walker's a big supporter of yeah. ERA and they've been very strong to yeah, to be behind this. And so let's keep our fingers crossed that once and for all this thing can happen. Hey And these bills matter. So yeah. you know like they're not just um, they're not just uh, in spirit. They matter. It matters. Before we go, I just wanted to ask you, you know, you, you're such a powerhouse and you're such, such an activist and, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of fearlessly doing good things in the world. And who, who is your role model? Who did you watch growing up that gave you the courage to be brave, not perfect, and that, you know, to take risks and to, to do things that a lot of other people, a lot of other women in particular may shy away from doing? You know, I really grew up admiring Hillary Clinton. She was the fearless leader for me. She was the one who dusted off that pantsuit and kept going. And, you know, similarly for me, she had an arc in her life. She was always fighting for women and girls. And for me, it's the same, right? It's like, you know, I want to be Batwoman for women and girls. Like, you know, when, when, when Gotham City, you know, is on fire for women and girls, like, I think we need people who are there fighting for that, for, for us. And I think even in this moment, it's like so many moms, like, just don't feel seen. And I think that when you have an opportunity to use your platform, to use your voice, to help others, to uplift others, especially in moments of crisis, I think you got to do it. And, and finally, I just wanted to know if you had any closing thoughts on sort of the terrible news in, in mm. Atlanta. And, yes. um, you know, I, I did a story a few weeks ago and I actually noticed at the beginning of the pandemic, I wondered how Asian Americans were faring 
during this time when there was so much emphasis in certain quarters about the China virus and all that Wuhan virus that I think primed people to have this, this prejudice uh, that probably existed already, but uh, against Asian Americans. And I'm just wondering, I mean, this is a whole conversation, but a, how we can support our Asian brothers and sisters, our Asian American brothers and sisters, and, and B, how we can address this issue and, uh, you know, help educate people and make them more accepting and, and appreciative of the diversity that, in my view, makes this country so yeah. great. You know, it's interesting, Katie, I was at last night, I was laying in my bed when I read that, because now it's too many incidences. And it reminded me of, um, you know, um, back in the 80s, when you had all of this enormous amount of hate crimes. And, and I laid there in the, my bed, and I started counting how many times that it had happened to me. And I, I had to stop counting. And what I mean by that, like, I grew up as a brown girl, like in a, in a, in a very working class neighborhood, and my house was spray painted. You know, go back to your country. My my house would be TP'd weekly. I was beat up in at, in in a schoolyard fight after being called a haji. Uh, you know, when I was running for Congress here in New York City, uh, I, we were constantly, constantly called names. Um, people asked about what my religion was, and after nine eleven, I I didn't feel comfortable in getting on a subway because too much had happened. So, so many of us have experienced so many things, but we were quiet about it. It almost became normal and accepted that this violence would continue to all of us have several stories, not just one, not just two, but several stories. And I think that for a lot of us, this is the moment to really speak out and to say that, like, you can't treat me with violence. You can't treat me this way. And that we are American, too. Uh, and our stories are relevant and that they matter. I think so much of the work that I do today is because I've been that terrified little girl um, for most of my life. And I know most of my Asian brothers and sisters have the exact same experience. And so this is really, I'm sure, hitting home for you. And I think that, uh, you know, I think one of the positive things we've witnessed in the last year or so is people speaking out, feeling empowered to tell their stories and say that they don't have to sublimate their experiences, you know, for the sake of assimilation, that you can right. be proud of your heritage and proud to be an American. Yeah. And people need to, to really just, uh, understand that this country doesn't belong to one particular group. It belongs to everybody. And That's right. That's right. And our black brothers and sisters have led the way, you know, because of black lives matter. And we know what it means to be anti-racist and we know what it means to fight for your identity and your place. You know, when my parents, when my father came to this country every day, every week, Katie, he would go to Toastmasters to get rid of his um, accent. He changed his name from Mukun to Mike. Everything was about fitting in, fitting in so you didn't face violence and harm. Think about that. And so we've come, hopefully, we thought, you know, such a long way, but we have so much longer to go. And I think when we share our stories, you know, Asians, our Jewish brothers and sisters, our black brothers and sisters, all of us, you know, all of our, if we share our stories and our commonalities and our experiences, I do have hope and faith um, that this country, you know, at its core is good and people are good. And the more we share our stories, uh, the more we can heal. Well, that's a really wonderful way, I think, to end this conversation. Rush, Rush I'm such an admirer of yours. I think you know that. Thank and you. I really uh, appreciate everything you've done and all that you've contributed in your young mm -hmm. life. <laughs> so Not far. so young, but thank you. And I, I love you, Katie. You are always lifting women up. You're always lifting me up. You've done so much and you've used your platform your power to be generous and to lift up others so thank you for that well thanks i i never feel like i do enough so i appreciate that you do uh, anyway reshma sajani thank you great to see you hopefully we'll see you thank when you. things uh 
when things calm down. And, and I just want to say thank you to everybody who has been a part of this conversation. I love the community that I always say that we built here on Instagram um, and, and love my followers so much, most of them. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I wanted to say thank you to Jane Walker for celebrating Women's First. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think next week I'm doing a sip and talk with Sophia Bush who is really cool as well. So Reshma, good to see you. And uh, I wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Okay. Bye Reshma. Bye everybody. Bye.